Science 1 MD3. Everybody in the right class? I assume everybody's in the right class because you're here in the summer. Um, <clears throat> so this is a class on introductory programming. Um, how many people here from the science faculty? How many people here from the business faculty? Health sciences? Social sciences? Humanities? Engineering? Hey, there we go. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is what you might call a lot of your first taste of programming. How many, how many people have done programming before? So for the majority of you, this will all be brand new material. Um, so are we recording? Yes, we are. Awesome. So programming is difficult. All right? This is not going to be an easy course. This is going to be a course that also moves very quickly because of the accelerated summer schedule. Uh, one of the things that you will find uh, is that, you know, concepts, we're going, like, this is an introductory course, right? So we are going to start from the very bare bones basics of programming, but by the end of this course, you will be doing complicated and amazing things that are actually practical with respect to real-world programming. However, we're going to be taking you from absolutely nothing to that level in the course of seven weeks, approximately speaking. So this course moves fast. If you don't keep up with the homework, you're going to get behind and you're not going to be able to accomplish the course with the kind of grade that you expect. Um, Another thing which is uh, a new change that the department uh, is, is making, how many people are sort of taking this course, perhaps interested in taking future computer science courses in the, uh, offered by the CAS department? Fair number of you. You have to get at least a B in this course now. Um, this is a uh, change that's been made to the level two requirements. Uh, basically because uh, a lot of the profs of the upper year courses have gotten sick and tired of having a bunch of students in their classes who, you know, don't know their input from their output. So um, they've tightened up the restrictions on entry into level two courses. Um, basically, uh, it depends, like, what course you want to take. Certain courses have certain, um, like, you have, basically, the general rule is you need to get a B in the direct uh, prerequisites to a course in order to be able to take that course in the second, uh, at the second level. So, given that this course is prerequisite to pretty much everything, you should be shooting for a B. All right? That makes sense? I don't make the rules, I just follow them. Um, <clears throat> so another thing to keep in mind um, there will be a certain number of people in this room who already know how to program, right? I, for those of you who, uh, for whom programming is completely new, please do not be discouraged by looking over to the person next to you and seeing that they're having absolutely no trouble with this course whatsoever. If you have studied pro Python programming before, say in high school or as self-study, it's likely that you'll be able to pull off an easy 12 in this course, right? I hope that by the middle of the course, we're now, we start getting into stuff that'll be new for you, maybe a bit, you know, extend your abilities a little bit. Probably uh, not many of you have studied recursion uh, before, for example. However, um, for those of you who know some programming as well, uh, you know, before getting here, Probably the first couple of weeks of this course aren't going to be very interesting for you. I uh, implore you to still not let your guard down, because we will get to stuff that's interesting. Um, yeah, any questions so far? Okay. Um, this looks like it shouldn't be, this looks like a smaller group than the, the entire class. Should be. This looks like maybe half the people who should be here. Uh, maybe they had difficulty finding the room. Maybe it's the fact that it's a morning class. Maybe they already know programming. Who knows? <clears throat> so, 
We're going to, uh, for, this first, uh, for this first lecture, we'll go through the syllabus um, in some detail so that you guys have a good expectation for what this course is and how to perform well in it. Uh, after that, we will get into some actual learning material because we can't waste time. We don't have the time to waste. And um, yeah, we will do what is programming afterwards. I will try to keep in mind the time because I'd like to have a break around the middle, like a 10 minute break around the middle of the class because three hours is a long time to be sitting in a chair. Um, that being said, in weeks, other than this week, there will be tutorials which immediately follow this lecture, uh, most of which are either in JHE or BSB, I believe. Um, so that, you know, that basic, man, the echo in here is terrible. You guys hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Good lord. Just like carpets on the walls, that would help. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> first time teaching in this room. Man, it's terrible. Um, you know, it's probably, like, if we wanted to, we could probably just grab, like, practically any lecture hall, because they're all empty right now. But, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll stay where the registrar put us. Uh, I've already gotten into a fight with them this semester over the tutorials, so. Yeah, that, like, did anybody notice, like, looking at your, uh, at your mosaic that, like, two rooms were assigned for some of the tutorials. Yeah. You want to know the story about that? It's kind of funny. So, um, over the course of the, uh, the online offerings of this course, um, basically, because we weren't actually meeting in physical rooms, the department expanded the, um, expanded the seating on the tutorial sections. Those didn't get re-shrunk now that we're back in person. It was kind of uh, a clerical error. And it turned out that, you know, basically this class is, is vastly underpopulated. We have like room, we have like a, another 130 seats in this class that aren't filled. Um, basically, we were trying to schedule four groups of 50 students in the computer labs and there simply are not that number of computer labs with that many computers on campus, if you can believe that. So the, you know, the brilliant solution that the registrar came up with was to simply book a class across two rooms. You know, kind of in seeming blissful ignorance of the physical realities of the situation, which is a TA is teaching a lesson in a room. They can't teach a lesson simultaneously with the, when there's a wall between there. So, you know, I mean, you could make an argument for like a lab section, because you have the TAs kind of walking around helping people, but it's a freaking tutorial, man. It's a lesson. How do you teach a lesson in two, cla in two classrooms at once? Doesn't make any goddamn sense. But anyway, so that's the situation we found ourselves in. Um, I had a word with the registrar about it. We've got it tightened up so that we're no longer having classes split across different rooms. So there should be an update to everybody's, uh, everybody's tutorial sections in Mosaic. We're still kind of, you know, figuring out the details on it. Fortunately, tutorials don't start this week. We've got a little bit of time to figure it out. But that's the situation with the tutorials. And my god, it's been quite the wild week, I can tell you. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so, right, so anyway, breaks, um, when we do run tutorials, I kind of want to hold the break, like normally I do two ten minute breaks in the middle of a three hour block, I kind of want to hold those for the end so you guys can have 20 minutes to like go and get, you know, food or something, you know, is this a, is this a plan which is acceptable to the class? I'm seeing nodding of heads, okay, that, we will proceed along that basis then. Good. So, um, introductions. My name is Nicholas Clifford Charles Moore. I will be your professor this semester. Um, if you wish to get in contact with me, my email is moorenc at mcmaster.ca. 
in future, if you have any, uh, if you want to get into contact with anyone, please consult the, the syllabus. Um, the syllabus is your one-stop shop for all of the uh, information you need about this course, so please consult it. Um, I'm going to be holding office hours after the Monday tutorial in my office, which is ITB 102. That is not AB 102, but just regular 102, which is on the other side of the building. We have three TAs this semester. We have Mark Hutchison, Sarthak Anand, and Manav Sharda. Um, they're going to be, they're, they haven't decided when their office hours are going to be yet, but uh, they'll be having office hours as well, probably online. Um, but yeah, excellent TAs, all three. They have worked with, I've worked with these guys many times before, and I have never worked with more competent TAs than this group. So if you have any questions pertaining to anything related to the course, they are also very good people to talk to, possibly know more about it than I do. So. <clears throat> so. Some of you have, may, have made, may have noticed that I asked the class uh, for a volunteer to record this lecture at the beginning of the lecture. The uh, implication of that being that the lectures are going to be recorded. We are going to have them uploaded to my YouTube channel after the lectures are finished. So um, if you want a kind of an archive of the lectures, should you wish to watch them back, you know, and study from them or whatever it, whatever it is that you want to do with them, please check out the YouTube channel. If you're interested in such things, there are also back episodes, as it were, from this course in previous off, uh, pre yeah, pardon me, previous offerings. So if you'd like to get a jump start on a topic, you can absolutely take a look at the channel. <clears throat> Avenue is what we will be using to organize the course material distribution to you guys, um, mostly anyway. Your official great book is on Avenue. Um, when an announcement needs to be made, it is made typically on Avenue. Right, so the Avenue announcements feed is your, you know, official announcements feed for this class. And we do make important announcements, so it's good to keep on top of that. It is your responsibility as students to make sure that you're on top of the announcements feed. Okay? So, in addition, we have a Discord server. How many people already use Discord? How many people do not? One person. Okay. You should, you should no, get it. Behind no, you. behind you. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> we've got a uh, special Discord server set up for the class. It's uh, basically construed as a question and answer forum where you can have a direct line to the TAs uh, anytime, day or night. Uh, they are very good at giving rapid responses. And the idea here is that you guys are also participating in the forum, trying to answer each other's questions, uh, you know, helping people out, that type of thing, being a good citizen. We run our, a little bit of an incentive program. So, at the end of the semester, we'll tally up all of the, uh, all of the questions and answers. The top three questioners will receive an extra 2% on their final grade. The top three answerers will receive an extra 4%. Now these questions and answers must be endorsed by a TA, so you won't get it just by spamming the, uh, spamming the Discord. All right? They actually have to be good answers and good questions, as determined by the TAs. So uh, no funny business. Please don't spam, but uh, yeah. But yeah, so uh, please make use of the Discord. It's extremely, it's an extremely valuable resource. I don't know how many times I've had people come into office hours and they're like, oh, well, I don't really understand how this works. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know, but have you tried asking these questions on the Discord because you wouldn't have to wait for my office hours. And they're like, what's the Discord? And I'm like, oh, okay. 
you should get on the Discord. <laughs> so, <clears throat> moving right along. In order to distribute the assignments and uh, possibly the tests, probably the tests, in fact, we will be using an online system known as Jupyter. Jupyter can also be installed as a local system. You will have to do that by the end of the class. Uh, actually, you'll have to do that in order to submit assignment two, just to prove that you can. Uh, so Jupyter is a system where you have a document Embedded in that document are blocks in which you can write Python code, execute that code inside of the document. It's kind of cool. This is how we intend for you to fill out and submit your assignments, tasks, what have you. Right? Your solutions to the assignment will be embedded in the assignment document itself. When you submit an assignment, you will be submitting that notebook file, they're called notebook files, right? If you give us raw Python code, like a .py file, the first time you do it, we'll be like, okay, we'll take it this time, but we will not take it again. And any times after that that you submit a .py file, we will just give you a zero. That's how it works. You have to use the proper channels. Um, so, in order to use the, uh, in order to use Jupyter, you're going to have to be set up with accounts, which I don't believe has happened yet. So we'll post an announcement when you guys have all of your accounts, and you can log in and test everything. If you're accessing it from off campus, you'll need to uh, use a virtual private network. You'll need to VPN into the school. Everybody, uh, do you guys know how to VPN into the school by this point? How many people do not? Okay, so it's relatively simple. Um, if you, if you uh, go to the UTS website, basically if you Google McMaster VPN, you'll get a, uh, a link to a downloadable program, which is called Cisco, uh, well, Cisco blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> basically, you install that, when you want to connect to the school from off campus, you open up that program, you click connect, you fill out some details, which uh, are again available from the UTS website. And basically what that does is it spoofs your IP address so that you look like you're from the school when you're really not, right? Um, so, and of course you have to provide your login credentials in order to be able to do that. Uh, so, Essentially, this is a layer of security which exists around campus. You don't have to do it if you're actually on campus, but if you're not on campus, you have to do that. It's, uh, you can use the VPN also to get like the on-campus version of the library, the library's website, so you can access books and stuff. Um, it's a pretty useful thing to know how to do. Here's the link. All right. Any questions so far? Good. All right. <clears throat> so, I mentioned with assignment two, you will need to download and install your own local version of Jupyter. This is the link with which to do so. Um, Jupyter comes packaged in the Anaconda distribution, which is a version of Python that includes a bunch of other uh, fun little programs which are uh, you know, not all of them are necessary, of course, but uh, they're kind of interesting and fun to have around if you ever want to play around with them. Um, and Microsoft Teams is office hours. Well, it was a backup lecture location when the lectures were online. Otherwise, it was YouTube stream. But uh, yeah, so that's the important websites. Don't worry too much about it yet. If you uh, like, don't worry too much about Jupyter yet. We have a little bit of time before we have to uh, really have it. There's no assignment. Um, the assignment schedule, if you're worried about like having to actually submit stuff. Our first assignment will be due on May 15th. 
So you'll have some time to get everything together, and fortunately so will we. Good. <clears throat> so. so, lectures, of course, 9.30 to 12.20 p.m. Um, we will upload them to YouTube. The um, locations for the, uh, for the tutorials. So, anybody here in uh, uh, tutorial section four? No? We decided to close that section. So, and if you were assigned to tutorial section four, just go to tutorial section three. It's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, we had to collapse them because again, we have less than half the students that we were expecting. Good. There will be no tutorials in the first week of class. So, good. Prerequisites to this course. You should have one of Mathematics 1K03, Mathematics 1LS3, Grade 12 Advanced Functions and Introductory Calculus, or uh, Grade 12 Calculus and Vectors. I'm not actually sure if those courses still exist at high school level. They've been changing things up. But uh, anyway, grade 12 math, right? Anti-requisites, engineering 1D04. Um, good, good. By the end of this course, you, the students, shall have one, a working basic knowledge of the Python programming language, and by extension, imperative and object-oriented programming languages. Number two. You shall have a knowledge of Python sufficient for scaffolding further exploration of programming as a skill. Number three, you will learn how to organize, write, document, and test medium-sized programs. Medium-sized is like everything up to like, uh, you know, a few, like say 100 to 500 lines of code in Python, I'd say medium-sized. Uh, most of the programs you'll be writing will be small programs. Um, yes. You will come to an awareness of the limits of computation. You will have the ability to bring an informal problem statement into a computational formulation. That is, you're going to answer a lot of word problems. And you will have the ability to apply algorithmic techniques for solving complex problems. We're going to learn how to write algorithms. So, in essence, this whole course, right, we're going to teach you how to take a mathematical idea, break it down into a series of smaller operations, run those operations together to achieve some result. That is the essence of programming. You want to take a large, complicated problem, break it down into small, manageable pieces, solve those pieces individually, put it back together. This is actually a pretty good, uh, you know, strategy for life in general. <coughs> Calendar description, blah, blah, blah. All right. So, any questions so far? Let's talk about assessment. Assignments will be worth 30% of your final grade. Tests will also be 30%. The final exam will be 40%. Um, all evaluations in this course are individual in nature. No group work will be assigned, and looking up answers on the internet counts as group work and is punishable by a uh, force of academic dishonesty citation. And boy howdy, do we love convicting people of academic dishonesty in this class. I'll get to it uh, when we have that section. So, we have some instructions on how to do that. I'll leave you to read that on your own, on your own time. Assignments will be written using the online learning platform Jupyter Hub. Mm -hmm. The assignments are designed to reinforce the material presented in the lectures, as well as in the tutorials. Completion of these assessments is it absolutely crucial to your understanding of the course material. This 
is a skills-based class. This is not an abstract theoretical class. This is, you're going to learn how to program, right? Programming is a skill. You will be evaluated solely on the basis of your programming ability. We're not going to have any loosey-goosey questions, like multiple choice questions, true false questions. It's not that kind of a course. This is an applications-based course. All of your assessment will be application-based. Everything is word problems. All right? And this is good. This is the reason that we do it this way. The only, only way to learn how to program is to actually write programs, right? You're not going to learn programming from, you know, some kind of abstract knowledge gathering about the subject, you know? Your abstract knowledge doesn't count for a hill of beans if you can't actually program something, right? So that's how we're going to assess you in this class. You know, I sometimes get, uh, I sometimes get comments from students who didn't do particularly well on their exam saying something like, oh, my performance on this test does not reflect my true understanding of the material. My counter to that is, if you can't program it, you don't understand it. So, if you can't program it, you don't understand it. That's, that's the line in this class. Now, we're here to help you understand it, right? We're not just going to throw you into the middle of the lake, right? You have lots and lots and lots of resources available to you to help you overcome any conceptual hurdles you might be experiencing which are preventing you from being able to write programs effectively and efficiently, right? It is our purpose to teach you, but we're not going to be asking any multiple choice questions. Any questions so far, other than multiple choice questions? Okay. Boy, you're a quiet group. <clears throat> ah, you guys will warm up by the end. So, there will be, oh, pardon me, scratch that. Should read five weekly assign, uh, assignments. Um, so, assignments will be due Sundays at midnight every week. We'll have five of them in total. Late submissions will not be accepted unless it's late by like three or four minutes, in which case we will extend clemency. But otherwise, the deadlines are hard and we don't like deduct a certain percentage for lateness, you just get zero. Because that's how it works in the real world. Um, assignments will be auto-graded using Jupyter. So one of the reasons that we use Jupyter is that it allows us to run an automated suite of tests to interrogate the correctness of your uh, questions in an automated manner. Um, this allows us to free up all kinds of TA resources uh, from marking to actually helping you guys out with the task of programming, right? So um, we can take these, these human resources that formerly were pointed in the direction of marking and grading papers and we can turn that towards you so that you can actually be helped by people, right? So please take advantage of the various aids which are available in this class, all right? Good. So the assignments will have bonus marks on them. Bonus, bonus marks are limited to the category of assignments when you get them on assignments. So bonus marks on an assignment will contribute to the bon uh, to other assignments, but uh, that's as far as it goes. Tests. There will be one midterm test this semester. Um, this will be conducted on the school's lab computers, uh, computer labs. Uh, the tests are open book, but collaboration between students on test questions will not be tolerated. So essentially, it is reasonable that you should have certain aids available to you uh, as you would when you were programming any other task. 
such as the Python documentation published on the internet. It is reasonable that you should have that. It is also reasonable that you should have access to certain websites like Stack Overflow. Uh, Stack Overflow is kind of like, um, it's like question and answers, but specifically for coding problems. And it's, ex it's an extremely useful resource because only people, it's like you ask a question, it's kind of like Yahoo Answers, where like you ask a question and people provide answers and then the most correct answer gets upvoted. It's, a, it's really, really like, Stack Overflow is an essential resource uh, to programming in my view. Um, however, collaboration is prohibited. Uh, collaboration in this manner is also prohibited on assignments, by the way. Um, do not copy code, right? If you hit Control V, Control C, unless it's your own code that you're copying and pasting, you are in violation of the academic integrity policy. And again, we take it very seriously. Um, yes. The test will also have bonus questions, uh, but the test bonus marks only apply to the test, so it's kind of like it's kind of like shifting the denominator uh, a little bit. So, final exam, pretty much the same thing as the test, just later and with more on it and a little bit beefier. Your final, uh, the contribution of the exam to your final grade is capped at 40%. It will also have bonus questions. Any questions so far? Okay. Extension and late submission policy. If you use an MSAF, that gets you a three-day extension on whatever asset assessment you're MSAFing, so long as that's an assignment. If you MSAF the test, the percentage will go on the exam, and if you have to miss the exam, the standard university policy on deferred examinations will apply, which basically means you will be writing the exam in October during the uh, mid-semester recess. Um, MSAFs are submitted online. I, I, actually, I think they're done through Mosaic now, aren't they? Pretty sure, yeah. Should update that link. If you require accommodation beyond the scope of an MSAF, please talk to us. We are not, you know, we're not ogres. We will give you a certain degree of leniency should circumstances arise. Like, for example, Let's say, just off the top of my head, immediately before the deadline to the first assignment, you fall down a flight of stairs and break your left leg, right? And you're like, man, I really could use an MSAF because I'm in traction right now. Uh, good, you use the MSAF, you get your extension, everything's fine. Let's say, um, right before the submission of the fourth assignment, you fall down the same flight of stairs and break your other leg we would be happy to extend you consideration in the event of such a thing. Um, yeah. Also, if there's anybody in the room who has an SAS accommodation, please get those in uh, toot sweet, because we can't, uh, we can't you know, accommodate you if we don't know who you are or what we are accommodating, right? So make sure you, uh, make sure you get that out and in. Good. So, <clears throat> the course timeline. Seven week course, two lectures a week. The topics will be introduction, that's today, expressions, statements, structured data types, functions and recursion, numerical computation, Victoria Day is a holiday, testing and exceptions, object oriented twice, file IO, date, time, and graphing, databases, and machine learning. Sometimes uh, we don't get to the machine learning because things take longer because, you know, people are, uh, you know, asking a lot of questions which slow us down in the lectures, slash, I, you know, you may have noticed I have a certain tendency towards diatribe, which sometimes interferes. I'll try to, I'll try, I'll, I'll try to make it so that we get to the machine learning material this semester. <clears throat> Five assignments. Here are the due dates. We will be having the test 
in the fourth week. I don't know when because I have to book the room for it. Okay? Rooms, actually. Good? Everybody cool? Good. Should be fairly straightforward. We have a textbook. It is not compulsory. It is excellent uh, ancillary reading if you choose to do so, if you're the type of person who likes books. It's John V. Gutag's Introduction to Computation and Programming Using Python with Applications to Understanding Data. Second edition. Um, get it or don't. It's not like, like, this isn't a course where the problems come out of the textbook or anything like that. In fact, I don't think that the textbook even has any problems in it. It's just, uh, you know, if you want to understand programming and be a better programmer, it's an excellent resource. So, getting assistance. When seeking assistance, please try the following things in the following order. Number one, Discord server. Discord server has the fastest response time of any method of asking questions, including email. So if you have a question and you'd like an answer quickly, which, you know, most of the time you probably would, Discord is your, is your game. Second, ask your TA in tutorial. I always find it's better to ask these kind types of questions in person rather than uh, over email. A lot can get lost in translation. Um, either in tutorial or during their office hours, you have plenty of, like we've set aside lots of time for you guys to, um, you know, actually ask questions of the TAs. We have, like, because of the enrollment thing, we have basically one TA for every, you know, 23 students. So uh, you should, this is, that's like as good a ratio as elementary school, honestly. There should be no reason not to seek help if you need it. The question is, do you recognize when you need help? Um, if all else fails, you can email me. I will not have as fast a response time as the TAs in general. But uh, if you have a question which you want to send right to the top, um, you can email me. But keep in mind that I might send you back down the chain again. There's a chain of command. Follow the chain of command. Just like in the military. So. <clears throat> Academic integrity. This has been a, a particular problem for us in recent offerings of this course. For whatever reason, this year has seen a substantial increase in the amount of academic integrity that we're going to experience, uh, that we have experienced. Frankly, I've never seen anything like it this year. Um, in the first semester of this year, we convicted something like 31% of the class of academic dishonesty. And in the second semester, it was, I don't know, we still have yet to uh, run the numbers on the exam, but uh, basically we're on track maybe to be convicting 40% of the class. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if they've learned their lesson. If not, then probably we won't make 40%. But um, when I say convicted of academic dishonesty, I mean through the formal academic dishonesty process, i.e., you receive an official citation from us, which is CC with the Academic Integrity Office and the Associate Dean of your program, you, that counts as your first conviction, if it is your first convi conviction. It's not, like, convictions are not class limited. This is across your whole damn degree program, right? If you have, if you do it again, and there, believe it or not, there are lots and lots of people who receive their first convictions and then say, oh, God, but he won't catch me a second time. Failure of this course outright with a notation on your transcript that says F assigned for academic dishonesty. Try to explain that to an employer. 
if it's a third one, suspension or expulsion. I am deadly serious when I say, don't cheat because we'll catch you. We will catch you and you will not like the consequences. And I don't care if like your friend is having a terrible time with the course and your, they beg you and plead you and plead with you, please just let me see your answers. Just leave me alone with your assignment. I'm sure you can trust me. Conviction. Going online to use any of various sources, but most, we have the biggest problem with Chegg. How many people have heard of Chegg? Yeah, it's a, it's a plagiarism website. Just straight up, it's just plagiarism. Right? If you use solutions to the assignment questions that you find on the internet, we very easily find you, and we very easily convict you. All right? And again, if you cheat multiple times in this class, you will receive corresponding, like, we definitely, I don't, like, I haven't yet done a third conviction, but I've certainly done a number of second level convictions. And let me tell you, the process isn't pretty. When you get to a second level conviction, you need to get an impartial arbiter from an associated department who adjudicates the case, there are rules of evidence, there is a hearing, it's very lawyerish. And it's a pain in the butt, so I would appreciate it if you could just not cheat, that would be the easiest thing for me. Um, but yeah, don't think, oh, you won't catch me, because I will. All right? And I will enjoy convicting you. Because if there's one thing that I hate, it's cheaters. Any questions about any of that? Good. Question? Yes. Yeah. If you're going to use Stack Overflow, you can use it to understand some of the code better. Like, a lot of the posts on Stack Overflow are, here's this concept illustrator, right? Sometimes you get an actual question posted where somebody posts their code to a problem and then somebody else fixes it for them because they don't know that it's a university assignment or a, or a school assignment. If you use those, I'll find you and I'll convict you, okay? Good. Any other questions? Good. So, in case it needs to be stated, the types of things that you will be convicted of, plagiarism, plagiarism is vaguely defined as the submission as one's own work that is not one's own. Academic uh, dishonesty in general is the seeking to attain unearned academic credit or privilege. Right? Improper collaboration in group work. It often happens that I have, you know, two or three people who submit, me, su submit to me work that is practically identical. I say, hey, what gives? This work is practically identical. And they say, oh, oh, yeah, but we didn't copy paste. You know, we were just, you know, doing the assignment beside each other. If I can't tell whether or not you copy pasted, you're working together too closely. And just while we're on the subject, changing the variable names doesn't fool me. All right? Even changing the structure doesn't fool me. I, like, we can see, we can tell. We know when you, we know all of the little tricks, right? We've prosecuted in this year probably on the order of 200 academic integrity cases. So we know the manners, we know the way that things are cheated. We know the, the little tricks that are used. 
to try to fool the software to see that you're not cheating. And let me tell you, we have a pretty high conviction rate. All right? And I know like I'm raking you guys over the coals, and I know that's not even probably you guys that are the problem, it's all the people who've chosen to skip the first class. They're probably the ones that are the problem. I just need to emphasize, maybe word will get to the rest of them, maybe through the uh, recording. I'm watching you. Don't think you can get away with it, because you can't get away with it. Not in my class. I take it personal. All right. So, anyway. Um, good. So, one of the, one of the tools that we use to determine whether or not you cheated is a software, uh, a piece of software called MOSS, Measure of Software Similarity. It's a tool developed by the University of Stanford. Um, essentially, it runs a bunch of very complicated comparisons against two, uh, all, basically every assignment that gets submitted gets compared to every other assignment that gets submitted, as well as a bunch of internet sources, right? It generates us a plagiarism report we then go in and manually verify that each of the uh, hits that we receive is genuine plagiarism. At that point, we move on to the actual conviction. All right? Good. So, there's a common misconception about code. People think, oh, well, you know, there's really only one way to solve a programming problem anyway, right? Wrong. There are as many different programs that solve a problem as there are people writing them. In the same way that when you write an essay, all of the tiny little choices that you make about word choice and grammar contribute to create a unique essay, even if it's on the same topic, right? That same principle applies to programming code, you know, at least to questions that are more than three lines long, right? The methodology used to break the program down is going to be idiosyncratic to your own brain, right? You think like you do, nobody else thinks like you do, that way, that's what makes you unique, and it comes out in your programming code. So, there's only one way to solve the problem is not a defense against plagiarism, although I see it routinely, all right? It's like, okay, okay, we get it, don't cheat, jeez. All right, and the rest of this is just uh, boilerplate stuff. Um, the university reserves the rights to change the dates and deadlines for any and all courses in extreme circumstances, such as severe labor, severe labor, severe weather, labor disruptions, you know, the outbreak of global deadly viruses, uh, maybe, I don't know, like a uh, meteor hits the arts quad or something, you know, something similarly improbable to COVID. Um, anyway. If you want to read the rest of the boilerplate, then uh, please do so at your leisure. We're going to continue on. And uh, since this is not a week in which we have a tutorial, uh, I'm going to call a 10-minute break right here, and uh, we will resume class at 10.30. Size is like fixed by uh, some of the hardware inside that, so like 
even if I record a, a one hour lecture, it ends up in three segments. And then those have to be like put back together inside of a video editor. And then that has to be uh, re-rendered, which just takes a lot of time. So, so. Anyway, not that that matters. Although it might matter because I don't know, like, uh, I, you guys might have to wait till Wednesday to get the lectures from the week. Anyway, so, program. The reason we're all here, we want to learn how to code computers. Who, who can tell me why they want to learn how to code a computer? Yeah. Uh, as a technical skill for employment. As a technical skill for employment, sure. Anybody else? Yes. Automate stuff. To automate stuff, that's a better answer. Anybody else? So. You guys may have noticed that the world is moving and changing, and the direction of things is the reduction and the elimination of sort of information-based employment. Um, it used to be that you had to employ whole armies of secretaries to type up each of the, uh, each of the individual pamphlets that you were, you know. Back in the 1940s, you'd have like typing pools, and you'd just have like, like this, this, you know, this whole room full of like, you know, uh, people who went to college for, for a couple of months to learn how to use a typewriter, just typing away madly. Um, then the Xerox machine was invented, right? And there go all those jobs. So the, the trend for the last century or so has been an increasing degree of automation with respect to, you know, information processing based jobs, right? So basically you've got two choices. Right? You can either fill a position that won't exist in, you know, five or ten years, maybe fifteen years, because it's going to be programmed away, or you can learn how to be the one who programs it away. Right? Programming is the arts of automation. Right? But of course, you know, I probably don't have to sell you too hard on programming because you're in the class. You took the class, so you've taken the first step. Good. So, information, data, is math. All of it is math, even if, it, even if it's textual, it's still math, right? We're going to come up, like, one of the things we're going to study reasonably early on in this course is how letters are actually numbers to a computer. All right? Everything is numbers. All of those numbers are expressed in the binary system. How many people know the binary system? A couple of people. A little bit. All right. So I'm going to take a brief detour into computer architecture before we get to this because it's important for you to understand the beast that you're trying to tame. Computers operate on ones and zeros. That's what it means to say the binary system. Every number inside of a computer is expressed via a series of zeros and ones. Right? If you encode text, each character has a code value, that code, character code, is expressed in the binary system. Now there's a very, very good reason that computers use the binary system. People who know a little bit about computers but not very much are like, well, why would you use the binary system? Why wouldn't you use like a trinary system? You could express more, you know, and more numbers. It's like, no, and I'll tell you why. It's because of electronics. So the way that a computer works underneath the hood, right? You have electricity, which is running through wires and semiconductors. If, like, how many of you have studied electricity before? How many of you know what voltage is? Most of you, good. So, voltage, scientifically defined, 
is the electrical potential in any particular part of the circuit, right? So when you have a part of the circuit that is energized at what we call plus 5 volts or plus 3.3 volts, whatever high voltage is defined at for that circuit, that counts as a 1. If the, um, if the voltage in a particular part of the circuit is um, at the reference level for ground, or 0 volts, that counts as a 0. So we call, we call this high and low voltage, 1 and 0. These voltages can be stored in electronic components. Uh, we're not going to talk about how that's done, unless it's, again, one of my famous diatribes. Um, it's sufficient to know at this point that the electronics inside of the computer store voltages. These voltages express ones and zeros. Different components inside of, um, inside of the computer can produce different series of ones and zeros based on the inputs to that component, right? So if I have a, an electronic component that adds two numbers, what it actually does is it takes in a bunch of ones and zeros on one side, a bunch of ones and zeros on the other side, and produces ones and zeros out of the game, right? And that's essentially how a computer does math, right? So what is a program? What is software? Inside of your CPU, right? CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. You've got a CPU, right? You also have a memory unit. You have inputs coming into the system, and you have outputs coming out of the system, and you have interaction with memory. This is known as the von Neumann model of computation, or von Neumann architecture. The CPU has inside of it little modules for addition and subtraction and division and multiplication. Multiplication in computer, by the way, is uh, in computer speak is asterisk um, for various reasons, which we won't get into. All of your operations are contained inside of the CPU, right? What you are doing when you program, you are writing a series of instructions that say, use this operation on this cell and that cell and store it here. And that's all a computer does. Literally, everything that a computer does, you can break down into moving memory around, moving it into operation modules, and then storing the results of those operations back into memory. Now, this is a simplified model. Obviously, it's way more complicated than this. But this is what programming is, right? What I have just described to you is programming in what we call assembly languages. Assembly languages are the most basic languages that a computer, uh, that you can program in in a computer, that you can actually program, right? You can write an assembly program. You can directly manipulate the memory cells and the operations, right? However, for most purposes, this is way too tedious. The great power of computers is abstraction. We can take these very, very simple operations and construct more expensive and complicated operations from them. We can even construct operations sufficiently complicated that they actually resemble, resemble the mathematics that you guys are used to from your algebra classes, right? However, it is important that you understand, like there are some very important distinctions between the math that you guys have studied so far and math according to computers. The best example of this is that we have very different, we have a very different concept of what a variable is. Right? In mathematics, like algebra, 
a variable is some mathematical entity which may have multiple different values. And, you know, the object of many of your uh, computations that you would have done through grade school and high school is to find the value of x. The value of x is constrained by some set of mathematical parameters. It is your job to find it, right? That's not what is meant by a variable in computing. A variable in computing is a cell of memory which holds a value. Variables in computing always have some specific concrete value. That's the same thing as saying if you took some cell here, it is impossible for it not to contain some sequence of ones and zeros. Even if it doesn't mean anything, it's still expressed in ones and zeros. There's no such thing as a, you know, doesn't apply or not determined yet. It's a physically existing thing. And it must physically have either a zero or a one in each one of its individual memory cells. Does that make sense so far? I know, I've, I, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but, uh, and I know we're still on the title slide, but uh, um, any questions about that so far? Okay, so one of, one of the things that you have to do in order to be able to program a computer is you have to think like a computer, all right? What thinking like a computer means is it means thinking in terms of this concept of variables, thinking in terms of instructions, right? It doesn't matter what programming language you use, every programming language is eventually, uh, we call it compiling, it's compiled down to the level of an assembly language, right? Uh, assembly languages are a direct textual uh, interpretation of what we call the machine language, which is um, basically a, an assembly language, but coded in binary code in such a way that the CPU can actually execute it. But you don't have to worry about that too much. So, why am I telling you all of this? Python is a high-level language. It's a more highly abstract language. What Python does is it takes large, large quantities of these individual CPU operations and composes them into individual programming statements. You, the programmer, can program in these statements and not have to worry about things at the assembly level, which is fortunate because A, it's very complicated and difficult, and B, most people screw it up anyway, right? So, good. So what do we do? What do we do when we program? Computers are input-output machines. They take some input, they produce some output. That's all they do. Everything that a computer does can be characterized as either an input or an output operation, depending on where you consider input and output to be. For most of the uh, programs that you'll write, the memory is considered both an input and an output to the program, right? It's like, let's put it this way. Let's say you're writing an essay for an English class, right? You're typing away, typing in your word processor. What are you actually doing? You're changing the state of a file in your memory, right? On your hard disk or a solid state drive. Hard disk is good enough. The input is the file before your modifications. The output is the file after your modifications, right? The, um, from a sort of a macro level, this is an output device, right? We are viewing information encoded in the computer in order to be able to see the slide, right? The slide is just a sequence of ones and zeros on a hard disk, just like everything else, right? The keyboard and the mouse are inputs to the program. They allow us to select commands, enter text, all of these different things, right? Good. So far, so good. So the question is, the operative question of programming, how does one arrive at the outputs from the inputs? 
This is the algorithm. So let's take a look at some examples. So let's formulate some problems. What is the square root of 25? Anybody? Five. Very good. What is the square root of some number y? The square root of y is some number x such that x times x is equal to y. This is a description of the problem. From this description, we can create an algorithm which calculates a square root. We're going to be doing that a little later on in the class. Um, this is a problem description from which an algorithm can be composed. Right? So let's take, let's take a look at a different one. Here's a different problem. How do you compute the x-intersect of a function f? Well, we know that the x-intersect of a function f is f at some x such that f at x is equal to 0. Let us make some assumptions to uh, make the algorithm a little bit easier to compute. We will assume that f is monotonically increasing on some interval a, b. So what, what it means to be monotonically increasing is that for any point on this interval, if it's to the right, it's also higher, right? So effectively, the entire, like through this entire section, it only increases. Um, now, you know, this could be something like a sine wave, where it comes back down again, but since we're only concerned about this interval a, b, that's all we have to be concerned about. Make sense? So far, so good? So, here is one algorithm which would allow you to calculate the x-intersect on this interval, assuming you have a and b. So our inputs to this algorithm, number one, the function, obviously, number two, the, pos uh, the values of a and b, number three, some epsilon, that is to say error. Um, so, so, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to try to find the position here within some range, right? This range is 2 times epsilon. Make sense? There, now, there's a good reason that we do it this way and not, uh, not try to find the exact in x-intersect using this method. This is a bisection method, which means that the overall view of how this uh, algorithm works is we reduce the size of the interval upon which that x-intersect can be found by half at each step. Uh, anybody know of Zeno's paradox? Nobody? Okay. So, Zeno's paradox, right? Um, let's say you have um, two men, one shoots an arrow at the other. The arrow halves the distance between uh, itself and the other man each second. Does the arrow ever reach the other guy? It does not, right? It's like if you have an interval, and you have half that interval, and then you have half that interval, and then you have half that interval, half that interval, half that, interval, half that you see the problem? You would need an infinite number of steps in order to reduce that down to the level of a single value. Uh, so that's basically the reason that we look inside of a range instead of looking for a precise value. The other reason is that that precise value may not even exist inside of the computer's uh, ability to formulate numbers. 
which is something that we will talk about in topic six, numerical computation. Make sense? So this is the algorithm. As long as b minus a is greater than epsilon, that is to say, so long as this interval is larger than the epsilon, we do steps two to four. First, calculate the midpoint. So we find m. If f at m is less than or equal to zero, set a equal to m. Otherwise, set b equal to m. So this is how it's worked. Do I have more boards here? Oh, bloody whiteboard. <laughs> it's a one, it's a two chalkboard semester. This is a terrible brush. Oh my god. It's like somebody took a wax crayon. Somebody's been using this on the whiteboard. What a way to run a railroad. See, see how much better that erases? Good God. So, this is, uh, this is the algorithm illustrated. So, we have the x-axis, we have some miscellaneous function. We have an interval a, b, right? Uh, let me do it differently so that it shows up a little better and do more than one step. Okay, so some interval a, b. We assume that the x-intersect exists along that interval. That's an input assumption, right? So we don't have to prove that. We just assume it to be true. We assume that this thing was called with some degree of uh, uh, intelligence, which, you know, might be an assumption. We calculate m. So m, uh, so, you know, if this was 3 and this was 5, then m would be 4, right? But anyway, we calculate m. We examine what the value of the function is at m. So we draw and, oh, there we go. Is this greater than or less than x? Or, sorry, is this greater than or less than zero? In this case, it's greater than. If this is above zero, right, and this is below zero, and this thing is always increasing, we can assume that the x-intersect must be inside this reduced interval, right? So we can, in fact, exclude this entire range from our consideration. So, what we effect, uh, effectively do is just relabel this as b, or, sorry, take the value that we calculated for m, assign it to the variable b, and then run the same algorithm again. Right? So, we calculate the midpoint again. This time, it's below. Right? So, we know that it, the intersection itself must be somewhere between here and here, right? We can exclude this error region from consideration. Good. Then, rather than moving B down, we move A up, right? So we now have a, an interval which is one quarter the size that we start off with. Each time we iterate this, the size of the interval remaining is 2 to the power of the number of times that we've iterated the, or 1 over 2 to the power of the number of times we've iterated the algorithm. Make sense? Any questions so far? One more time. Find m, which should be roughly the midpoint. It's above, so we reduce, move b here, that becomes b. Now we're dealing with a much smaller interval. Basically, you keep doing this, until that interval is smaller than epsilon, at which point um, you're finished. You have found the approximate x-intersect. Now, this methodology of finding x-intersects, um, it's a little bit less vulnerable to the function itself than something like the, uh, uh, the Newton's method that uses the, uh, the um, what do you call it? The, not the determinant. 
Forgetting my calculus terms. Good lord. D over dx. What's it called? Derivative. Derivative, thank you. You're welcome. So the problem with the derivative method, right? If you end up with a derivative that's like here, like if you imagine this being like a flatter region, you know? If you end up with this and you get like something way off there, you can, like the, the derivative method can really be thrown off by like, you know, near level points in the function. So there is actually some utility to this and you don't necessarily need calculus. Incidentally, it's difficult to make a computer do calculus. So generally speaking, um, most of the numerical methods that we will use in computing don't have anything to do with calculus. Uh, you can get a computer to do calculus, but it's, um, well, it's, it's just not easy. Uh, it requires, it's, it's like a skill. It's a skill to get a computer to take an integral. Um, you have to use symbolic math. Google symbolic math or a symbolic math library. Uh, anyway, so, good. So the question then becomes, what would this look like if it were a program, right? So, those of you who may be a little bit more observant may have noticed that I don't use Windows. This is Linux. This is Linux init, actually, because um, all the cool kids use Linux. So, yeah. Uh, some spray. Python program is just a plain text program. Uh, it's just a plain text file sitting on your computer. What makes it a program is the fact that a um, a compiler can interpret it. So let me just uh, make a new tab here. So define function intersect. I should preface this by saying I do not expect. I do not expect you guys to be able to do this at this point, obviously. I, the point of this example is so that you can get like a look at what a program looks like, how it's constructed, you know, like an overall top-down view. I don't expect you to be able to reproduce this just because I've shown you this once, right? Uh, in actual reality, this is not a program that you guys will be able to produce probably until topic four or five. Okay? So don't don't get stressed out. So we've got F, A, B, and Epsilon. Um, so while A minus B is greater than Epsilon, if or we calculate m, m is equal to a plus b divided by 2. Got to put the brackets in, Other way, otherwise it's a plus b divided by 2. If f at m is greater than 0, we do something. Otherwise, we do something else. If, uh, oh, what's that again? If it's greater than zero, we move B in. So B is equal to M, otherwise A is equal to M. When that finishes, so what we've done so far, we've declared what the inputs are, we've written the algorithm as expressed by the numbered list on the slide, what we have not yet done is designated what the output is supposed to be. And this is not something that's actually discussed on the slide. There are basically two ways of going about it. Um, you can either return the interval itself, or you can return the midpoint of that interval, um, you know, if you want to return a single value. I'll choose the first one. So, return a plus b divided by 2. Good. 
we have defined the function. Functions are the modular units of programming code. Right? It's a program that takes inputs and produces outputs. Right? In order to actually execute the, this function, we have to provide it with real inputs. All right? We have to provide it actual values and then execute it. So, we will display the results of computing the intersect of some function, let's say, parabola, say, on the interval, interval from 0 to 10. And with an epsilon of 0 0.0001. Now, the question now becomes, what the bleeding heck is parabola, but the computer doesn't know? So we have to define that one as well. Define function parabola takes an input x. Return x squared minus Right? So, essentially, if you were to graph that, you get something like that if this lined up with the and Still slightly off. You can tell how experienced a professor is by how well, how well they draw diagrams. Um, actually, the dotted line test is the best one to see how experienced the prop is. Question? Uh, wouldn't A minus B be a negative number? Isn't that just a negative number, so it wouldn't work? Yeah, it's B minus A. Thank you. Appreciate it. I do not claim to be perfect. So, there we go. Um, good. So, let's, uh, let's run this program. So, if you were doing this inside of a Jupyter environment, all you would have to do is hit Shift Enter, and it would execute this code for you. Because I'm doing this sort of bareback in the operating system, uh, I actually have to run the Python process on this file. So, Python 3. Topic 1.py. There we go. We return a result. Oh, it's, oh that's not too bad for a cutoff. That's, that's okay. So yeah, so the answer is 2.4... 2.45. Make sense? Now, an interesting thing we can do we can insert some print statements in here to take a look at what the data is actually doing. So, we can say, uh, print a is equal to, print the value of a, print b is equal to, print the value of b, print m is equal to, print the value of m, and print f at m is equal to, and the value of f at m. When something in a program is enclosed in either single or double quotes, that is text. Right? So this is text that I actually want displayed. Right? Good. And then uh, I always like to um, uh, print a separator. So, we can see, we start off with the interval 0, 10, midpoint is 5, f at m is 19, right? So, we move, uh, we move um, b in then 2.5, there we go, move B in again, M is 
this is negative now, so we put that to A, right? All of these steps are performed without you seeing them unless you ask for them, right? If you write the program in such a manner that all of these intermediate calculations are displayed, this is known as tracing, right? Tracing is one of the most important tools in your toolbox for programming. In order to determine whether you have written your program correctly, it is absolutely necessary that you should know how the intermediate calculations are being performed. Make sense? Let me show you something else that's cool. So that's method one. Out of here, all of you things. My God. All right. So there is a website called Python Tutor. The size of the program that you can use in Python Tutor is somewhat limited, but it should be good for most of the programs that you write in this class. I really like the way that Python Tutor visualizes the program. So you can take a program, copy it in, visualize execution, and it presents you with your program on the one side and the, all of the intermediate variables on the other side. So if you slide this time, timeline along, you can see that you know these are the values that are uh, the case at any particular point in the timeline. Right? And you can kind of, in the same way as you scroll through this text up here to find you know, some previous value, you can do it using the timeline here. Right? Make sense? Furthermore, if you want to see how many times or where a particular statement is executed, you just click on it and it highlights it. So you can sort of jump to those particular points and you can go through by individual. Yeah. There you go. So this is known as debugging. I'm showing you this now because this is an essential tool that will enable your success in this class. All right? Learn this now, learn it well. Start pro like if you're new to programming, I would even recommend doing your assignment problems, starting off doing them in Python Tutor, and then copying them into the, uh, the notebook to submit them. That's how helpful it is. Okay? Good. So anyway, any questions about that so far? Good, 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 good. All right. So, this is the part where he catches up with, uh, you know, 10 slides in the last 10 minutes of this block. Ha! So! There are many different programming languages. People sometimes ask, why on earth are there so many sort of programming languages? The answer is, each one of them does something slightly differently. And either, you know, even if a language is completely superseded by a new language that has all the same features, but much, much better, there will be enough old code still being run that's been written in the old language that it's still useful to know as a skill. Because one of the things that software people actually do for a job, maintain old code, right? Some of the code that's running inside my computer right now was written in the 1970s, right? Um, without the ability to maintain that code, we would have to re-implement. And let me tell you, the less re-implementing of old things you do, the more you can move forward into the future, you know? Um, would the uh, Apollo program have gotten to the moon if they had to redesign the rockets from scratch each time, right? 
Probably not. So, one of the ways in which, like this, this, court, uh, this part of the course, we're going to sort of talk in general terms about like some of the categories and distinctions of programming languages. So, how many of you uh, are taking or have taken uh, Computer Science 1JC3? A couple of you. So, this is a, uh, another course uh, that's offered at the first year level. Um, in that course, they study an entirely different programming language called Haskell. Haskell is in a different paradigm, and it operates almost completely differently to Python. It's very useful for very different things, right? Each programming language should be thought of as a tool, right? It is a wrench or a screwdriver. You should know what application the tool is applied to, right? You shouldn't use a carpenter's hammer when a sledgehammer is appropriate. You shouldn't use a screwdriver when you should be using a wrench. You shouldn't use a uh, circular saw when you're trying to put together a dollhouse. Um, all that kind of stuff, right? Pragmatic view of programming languages. Each of them have a purpose. There is no programming language that has universal applicability, right? So anyway. One of the uh, big divisions that occur between programming languages is, are you declarative or are you imperative? A declarative language tells you what should happen, right? It describes the properties of things. Haskell is one of these languages. In Haskell, you describe a calculation using text. The computer then figure out, figures out how to actually calculate it. Imperative languages are languages which are composed of instructions. Right? Each step should be sufficiently simple that a computer can execute it. There is a, uh, shall we say, a direct relation between an imperative language and an assembly language. Right? So, Declarative describes properties, imperative sequence of instructions. Good. Any questions? Good. So let's talk about algorithms. An algorithm is a sequence of instructions to be executed by a machine that is provided with input and will eventually stop and produce some output. The problem of the program stopping is actually a real one, right? It's very easy to write a program that will run forever. In fact, I can do it for you right now. So I can. So if you if you uh, call up Python with no file provided, you're provided with a command prompt where you can just enter Python code. It's not like in a file, but you can just, you know, if you just want to check what a statement does, you can do it that way. So, while true, uh, pass. So, notice how it's just hanging. I have to provide a keyboard interrupt in order to stop this program. I have to sort of, you know, kill the process. While is just a loop. It will do everything inside of here so long as the condition remains true. Normally, you provide some kind of actual condition, like this is less than that, or this is not equal to some other thing. If you provide a true itself, the literal true, true cannot ever be anything except true. So this loop cannot ever exit, especially given that there's nothing going on inside of it. Pass is like the do nothing statement. You probably won't use pass at all, but uh, you should know what it is and what it does. So that program will literally run until the end of time. This program will run until the 
electronic components that compose the computer fail, or the power supply fails, or the Earth gets absorbed into the sun as it expands. Um, that's, that's how long this will run. It's also, uh, it's also completely possible to write a program that will take longer than the age of the universe to run, but does eventually terminate. That's also extremely possible inside of a computer. And it actually comes up more often than you might think, unfortunately. Um, there's a very, very important result in uh, the, early, uh, the early years of computer science, um, which is that it is impossible to prove whether or not a, whether a, uh, a program will terminate automatically. It requires human intelligence. Like, you can't write a program to determine whether a program will halt or not, whether a program will stop or not. Uh, this is known as the halting problem. Um, so, <clears throat> algorithms can be many things. Um, if you consider a cookbook recipe, inputs would be ingredients. The recipe instructions themselves are the algorithm. The output is, hypothetically, delicious, yummy food. Unless you are a bad computer and have not executed the instructions correctly, in which case you will, you know, burn the pasta or whatever. Um, or, if the instructions are wrong, you will also not get the result you want. A traffic light also follows an algorithm for switching lamp status. The inputs would be time. Time is an important input. Car presence sensors, if applicable. Uh, pedestrian walkway buttons, if applicable. Instructions are the conditions upon which the lights should be lighted. And the outputs are electrical signals to the light bulbs. It's algorithms. You should think of everything in terms of its input, its algorithm, and its output in this class. And in fact, I don't think it's a bad way to look at life. So, the computation prescribed by an algorithm goes through a sequence of states, starting from an initial state, and each instruction leading to a new state. State is a very important word. We're talking about the state of play. When we say the word state, what we mean is the concrete values which are stored in memory that are being used by the algorithm. Right? So, when we did the example earlier, the values of A, B, M, and Epsilon are the state of the program. Right? The initial state is the input, uh, in that case, the inputs that are provided to the function, right? Um, that's not necessarily always going to be the case, but it was in this case. The final state is the state of that memory that's used to calculate the final result. The final result being the thing that's inside the return statement. Um, so, and a trace is, of course, looking at all of those intermediate states. Uh, similarly to many, many forms of mathematics which are currently taught, um, we have the uh, uh, medieval Islamic world to thank for uh, both our number system and algebra and the concept of algorithms. They were, uh, they were really knocking it out of the park in the, in the medieval period with respect to scientific progress. Um, so, uh, yeah, the word algorithm itself is a diminution Latinization of, like, a guy's name who published a, uh, published a manuscript on it, which was then read by, like, people in Spain who translated it and then, you know, spread it all over the rest of the place. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay. Break number two start. We shall resume class at 11.30. Cool. Continuing our discussion.
algorithms must be executed by a computer if you're, you know, if it's a program. If it's a recipe, it must be executable by a human. If it's a program, it must be executed by a computer, which means that it must be expressed sort of using the mechanics of the computer system. So this means it must be precise and it must be effective. A very highly important property of computer programming languages is that they must not be in ambiguous states. Ambiguity does not exist in programming languages. If you think it's ambiguous, you don't understand the language sufficiently, right? Each state is calculated exactly and precisely from the previous state by means of the instruction requested, right? That means that the state of memory is always, always, always deterministic. Um, there is no free will inside of a computer. So, each single instruction does only one thing. You can think of each instruction as a mutation or manipulation of the program state, but it always does so in a precise, controlled, and predictable manner. If the outcome of your program is unpredictable, it means that it has a bug. That means that it has some statement in it which does not, um, it sort of works against the purpose that you intended, right? If your outputs are not as expected, it means that your program is wrong, right? So, in addition, the algorithm must be effective. Um, essentially, it's an algorithm which uses instructions that the CPU doesn't have is not an effective algorithm because it can't actually be executed. And you might be saying, well, obviously, you know, if it's written in a computer language, all of those instructions would be instructions that exist, surely. And, uh, well, it depends. Different CPUs have different sets of instructions they support. So a program written for one CPU Sometimes, it depends, this hasn't really been the case since like the 1970s, but so, uh, back in the 1970s, a program written for one computer was not necessarily applicable to another. You often had to completely rewrite the program for each individual model of computer that came out because the, the processor would change. Uh, after, you know, after putting up with this for like a couple of decades, um, humanity decided to uh, collectively invent programming languages that were stable across uh, different computers, and hence the modern age was born. Good. So, um, just because I, I spent a little time. So, there are a few slides in here that I'm going to skip. They're kind of like quiz questions, um, because we did this example out as a program, so I'm going to skip them. So, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip that, I'm going to skip that, good. Um, if you want to read those on your own time, please feel free. So, fundamental questions about algorithms. Correctness. What does it mean for an algorithm to be correct? It means that when you calculate the output, it is intended from the input. So we have some concept of what constitutes correctness that exists outside of the algorithm, right? In the case of the, uh, you know, your lives over the next seven weeks, this is going to be, does my algorithm conform to the problem statement given to me in the assignment slash test slash exam, right? The output must be the intended result given the inputs, right? Otherwise, the algorithm is not correct. We have a, um, we have a phrase in computing, garbage in, garbage out. So if the input is incorrect, the output will be incorrect, right? 
there's no way to produce correct output from an incorrect input. It just, it doesn't, it's, it's like a law of the universe, you know? Uh, however, if the input is correct, and the output is not what was intended, we have an error. These are generally known as bugs. Uh, does any, do any of you know the origin of the term bug? It's kind of fun. Okay, so. I want you to cast your brains back into the misty realm of the 1950s when a computer would have occupied a room of this size, right? One computer, this room, right? You would have had like a console in the middle that had like a keyboard and like gigantic banks of like, uh, what do they call vacuum tubes? And it would all be doing computations. Um, Back in those days, the individual elements of a computer were often um, wired up together inside of these large cabinets. And this was before uh, rubberized insulation for electrical lines was popular. Um, you would have had braided, uh, braided insulation on com electrical lines, like cotton line, but um, that would, have been, that would have been overkill for the, uh, for the period, right? So you had a bunch of like these open electrical lines just inside of the computer system, right? Occasionally, you would have a vermin problem. And let me tell you, inside of university buildings, uh, you know, uh, don't lick the floors, basically, because, uh, <laughs> you know, there's definitely a vermin problem. Uh, in this very building, in fact. Um, although, you know, I'm not sure how much of a problem it is at the moment, but, it, you know, it comes and goes. Anyway, if some small creature, like a mouse or a, uh, a cockroach or something, got into the computer system, made contact across two wires that had, uh, you know, plus five, and zero, or plus 10 and zero, or however, whatever the voltage they were running it at, zap! The, the poor little critter would fry. Sometimes closing the electrical contact with its, with its fried body across these two electrical lines. Now it's interesting, right? Because in these types of situations, you wouldn't necessarily end up with a, like a short circuit that would break the computer. What you would do, what that would do is introduce a flaw in the logic circuit, right? So, the computer would just not execute the logic that it was intended to execute correctly. So, what the, what this, the, the terminology that arose is, oh, there's a bug in the system. Because in those days, it was a literal, literal bug. And this also derived our term for getting rid of bugs, which is debugging. And uh, so the original computer debuggers were, um, uh, small people, because you had to be small to fit inside the cabinet with a pair of tweezers, you know, picking bugs off the circuits. That was debugging back in the day. Uh, these days we have more sophisticated methods that don't involve tweezers. <laughs> but anyway. So, question number two. Algorithm efficiency. Algorithm efficiency is generally um, considered along two uh, important metrics. How much time does it take to execute, and how much memory does it use, right? As I stated previously, it is absolutely possible to write an algorithm to calculate something that will take longer than the universe is old. Um, if your algorithm takes that much time to execute, it is not an efficient algorithm, needless to say. It's also possible to use, to write an algorithm that would consume all of the memory in the universe. And if you consider, like, each individual quark as being a zero or a one, depending on whether it was one or, you know, one or the other of the pair of quarks, uh, you would still not have enough memory, right? It is possible to completely exhaust the resources of this universe with a single computation task. Um, if that is the case, it is not efficient. Now, there are things we can do to make algorithms more efficient. In fact, the uh, research of algorithm efficiency is an entire sub-discipline 
of uh, computer science and software engineering. Um, but this, like when we're talking about efficiency, this is what we're talking about. Time and memory, which generally are both considered resources. So we'll get into like more on how to measure the efficiency of algorithms later on. Generally speaking, we're concerned about things like, you know, if we give this sort of quasi-random inputs, what's the average case runtime? What's the worst case runtime? If I were to construct inputs that would take as long as, like, well, the worst case scenario in terms of runtime, how long does that run, right? Because, you know, it's actually okay to have a worst case runtime that's ridiculously bad, so long as the average case is good and the, uh, the worst case scenario is sufficiently rare, right? You can kind of amortize the worst case over all of the averages, but, uh, or anyway. So, um, good. Skip that, skip that. Okay. So, so we've talked a lot about the properties of algorithms, but we haven't really talked about the structure of algorithms just yet. So, a good way to enter into an understanding of how programs work is through the use of flowcharts, right? So, when we have a square, that designates an instruction. This will be something like, you know, turn the green light on, subtract V from U, some kind of manipulation of program state, right? Everything is manipulation of program state. It's either taking an input, producing an output, or manipulating state. That's all you get, right? And if you consider the program itself to be an entity in memory itself, then, you know, picking your path through the program is also a manipulation of program state, because there's a, uh, there's an element of memory that tells you where you are in the program called the program pointer, right, or the program counter, that tells you what instruction you're on, so when you're doing a loop, all you're doing is like telling the program counter to go back up to a particular instruction repeatedly, right? So that's also a manipulation of state. But anyway, statement. We then have conditional statements, branching statements, also known as if statements. An if statement takes some condition. If that condition is true, it follows one branch. If it's false, it follows the other. You don't have to do a true-false, like there are various constructions of if statements that we'll look at, but the, uh, the, like, the important thing to get, you have a decision, if you decide the decision one way, it goes down one path. If you decide it the other way, it goes down the other. Algorithms are precise. Whenever you reach a conditional statement, you don't wait for it to be decided, right? It is immediately decided because it is immediately calculatable from the current program statement. So there's no waiting for decisions to be made. The decision is made like in one calculation, right? This is what we mean, this is part of what we mean when we say the program must be precise. You provide a formula here, right? This formula uses the state of the program to determine which branch you go down, right? It's not like, uh, you know, um, go down this one if I feel like it, go down this one, if I also feel like it, and on Tuesdays I feel like going down both. That's not how it works. You go down one or you go down the other. Precision. So, furthermore, we may compose our flowcharts by running them together in standard flowchart manner. Uh, sometimes you can have a uh, 
a little dot to start off, and a little dot to end off, depending on how you feel. Depending on whether you feel particularly rigorous today. So. It's kind of strange to say it, but as of the end of this slide, you know all of the programming concepts that you need to program. All programs decompose into statements, conditionals, and loops. Every single program can be broken down in that manner if you're looking at a sufficiently uh, you know, if you're looking at the right level, right? There's a very interesting result, actually. Um, anybody, uh, anybody in the room know who Alan Turing is? Anybody seen the Imitation Game? Yeah, that's the guy from that movie. Um, so, Alan Turing occupies the same position uh, within the mythos of computer science that someone like Newton or Einstein would in physics. Um, one of the very famous results which he came to with his, uh, his PhD supervisor, a man by the name of Alonzo Church, uh, was that it, the concept of um, equatability to a Turing machine. So, a Turing machine is a particular model of computation. We don't necessarily have to get into it. Um, essentially, you have programming languages which are considered Turing complete, and you have languages which are not considered Turing complete. If a language is Turing complete, that means that an equivalent Turing machine can be designed and built. Right? This means that it effectively computes everything that is, like a, a secondary result of this, everything that can be computed can be computed with a Turing machine. A very, very famous result in computer science for obvious reasons. So, when you have a language which is Turing complete, you can write any program written in that language in any other language which is Turing complete. Right? So, for example, take two co Turing complete languages, say Python and Haskell. Any Python program can be written as a program in Haskell, any Haskell program can be written as a program in Python because of the property of Turing completeness. Now, the question is how efficient is it to write that particular program in one versus the other? Right? It's like it's kind of like, sure, you can hammer the nail in with a wrench, but it might be easier to get a hammer, right? Um, but, in terms of imperative languages, if you have these constructs, plus the ability to create an infinite, non-terminating program, your language is Turing complete, basically. Um, incidentally, the way that Haskell claims Turing completeness because it doesn't have loops, is that it allows operations over infinite data structures uh, for the, you know, any of the people taking uh, 1JC3 in the crowd. So, <clears throat> if you understand these, these are your basics. If this, is, if, this was, uh, if this was karate, these would be your kata forms. All right? Know these well. Practice them every day. All right? Every program you write will use these. Well, not all of them will use loops, because loops are kind of a specific thing. But my gosh, pretty much every one of them will use conditionals. Conditionals you use more than loops. And you use a conditional inside of a loop, so anyway. So this is how it's structured. So, if B then S, we make a decision. We make decision B. If we decide yes, we execute statement. Otherwise, we skip it, right? Form number two, if then else. We arrive at condition B. If it's true, we execute S. 
Otherwise, we execute T. If then else. The while loop. We arrive at condition B. If that condition is true, we execute the statement S. We return control of the program prior to the condition. We re-evaluate the condition. If that condition is true again, we execute the statement again. We stay inside of this loop, this is why it's called a loop, so long as this condition is true. As soon as this condition becomes false and the condition is evaluated, we break from the loop and continue on with the rest of the program. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? I'm like completely dead serious when I say if you know if statements in a while loops, you can write any program. It's just a matter of how long it will take. <clears throat> so, so let's uh, let's examine what these things look like. Now, I have to warn you. This is not Python syntax. This is like math syntax for assignment. I don't know why they. I don't know why it's in the slide. To be honest with you, I've been meaning to redo these slides for several semesters now, but I've also been trying to graduate. So you know, you know how it is. Anybody else trying to graduate? None of you. There we go. All right. Good. Awesome. Anyway, so assignment. Assignment is the most basic instruction that you can perform in a computer, right? This is, this should become such second nature to you that you don't even, you don't even realize you're using them anymore. Um, using this should be like using, a, using like a knife and fork while eating. You don't even think about doing it, right? So, or a spoon or whatever, whatever your utensil is. So, we interpret it as x becomes e. e is assigned to x, right? This is not a statement of equality. This is, I am setting x equal to e. Uh, in computer architecture terms, I am taking the memory cell represented by x, I am performing some calculation e, storing the result of that calculation in x. You should think of variables as boxes that contain numbers. In Python, you can actually do multiple assignments. If you provide a comma, uh, a comma separated list of variables, you can assign them a comma separated list of expressions. Uh, I don't recommend using this. This is basically just so that you understand some of the stuff that's going to be on some of the later slides. I don't recommend this. It just confuses things. Just say x is equal to e, y is equal to x. <clears throat> so you can also perform arithmetic. For e, you may substitute any arithmetic expression or any expression in general. Um, something like x plus 2. Something like repeat this string seven times. Something like store the results of this function in this variable. All right? Because Python is an object-oriented language, the number of things that can be stored in X is actually quite broad. Uh, we won't fully appreciate that until we come to, uh, you know, week six. But, uh, but yeah. Any questions so far? Cool. All right. So, <clears throat> the following is a program which calculates the mean, uh, median, sorry, the median of three numbers. So, from statistics, the median is whichever, uh, if you take your data set and you uh, sort it by value, which the median is whatever's in the middle, right? You might say 
it seems kind of silly to have a dedicated function to calculate the median of only three numbers, since data sets are often larger than three. But, uh, you know, for the purposes of this example, let's just go with it. Let's go with the flow. So, so to speak, flow charts. Ah, jokes. So, we have x, y, and z as our inputs. Our first evaluation is x less than y. If x is less than y, we check to see if z is less than x. If z is less than x and x is less than y, we know that the, mid, the, the median will be x. Otherwise, we have to test to, to, to see if z is less than y. If it is, then we know that the midpoint is z, otherwise it's y. Make sense? Cool. <clears throat> so if we were to write a program, like an actual program, there we go, that computes this, def median, takes values x, y, and z. One thing uh, that's very important to note for any of you who may be following along on your computers, which, by the way, I highly recommend, computer programs are extremely unforgiving if you're not following the exact characters which it's expecting. Like, um, as, as you found out uh, during the break, it's like if you have square braces here instead of round braces, that's wrong and it won't compile. It won't run, right? Round brace, in this context, means this is a list of inputs. The braces themselves have semantic content. Semantic means mean, right? Syntax is the grammar. Semantic is what that grammar means, right? Um, so when I say a syntax error, what I mean is you used the wrong symbol or you otherwise messed up the grammar of the language. And I know it's kind of strange to think of a computer language as having a grammar, but uh, let me tell you, oh boy, yes, computer languages also have grammars. Um, so anyway, if you're copying these, make sure you copy the exact characters that, I've, that I'm doing, or else uh, you'll get a syntax error. So, if x is less than y, I'm going to just omit these as you can. Do stuff else. Do other stuff. If z is less than x, return x. I'm going to skip the part where we assign to m and just return the value directly. Else, if z is less than y, return z. Else, Return y, and uh, I'll just leave that blank because you know we have to keep moving. So, some very, very important points about how you write programs in Python uh, in comparison to other languages. How many people have used languages other than Python? What are they? C. Okay, good. Who else? Mm -hmm. Yes. Haskell. Haskell, yes. Java. Java, okay. Um, so Haskell is a little bit different um, because, you know, it's structured very differently. Um, for those of you who are used to uh, other, like, C-based languages in general, C, C++, Java, C Sharp, you know, Objective-C, all of these languages in these categories, languages that include curly braces, if you were writing an if statement, you would open a curly brace here and end a curly brace there, and everything inside of those curly braces would be inside the if statement. That's not how things work in Python. In Python, the level of indentation indicates the semantic content. So it's not designated by the presence or non-presence of curly braces. It is designated by the number of tab characters, or the number of tabs. We don't know what a tab, tab character is yet. So, essentially, 
starting at this if statement, we tab over by one. Everything that is at this level of indentation or more is inside this branch, the true branch of the if statement. Make sense? In similar fashion, all of the statements that are at level one indentation or higher are contained within the function definition. When we get to loops, we will see everything, well, actually we've got one up here. Everything that's at this level of indentation or higher is inside of this loop. If you mess this one up, you will have statements inside of like the wrong parts of the program and your program will just complete, like it'll, you know, um, the timing belt will fly off and wrap itself around your neck um, in mechanical terms. So, level of indentation is very, very important. It tells you what's inside some, what is inside what else, right? This uh, structure here is uh, something we call nesting, right? It's like, uh, it's like uh, Russian nesting dolls, you know? You pop it open and there's another doll inside. We've got if statements inside of if statements inside of if statements. We can have loops inside of loops inside of loops. There is no theoretical upper limit to the number of things that can be inside of other things. Um, however, the, more, the higher the level of nesting, the, um, shall we say, more difficult and complicated your program will be to understand. So, you should use fewer nested statements where possible, but if it's not possible, feel free, right? Um, in particular, the number of nested loops has a direct impact on the runtime of the algorithm because each of the inner loops has to be run once for each of the outer loops. So if you have a loop that runs five times and you've nested it four times, the number of times that runs is five to the power of four. And if you add one more loop inside of that that runs five times, that's five to the power of five, and you can see how that would stack up very quickly, right? Um, does that make sense? Cool. Any questions? Yes. The battery. Very close. Yeah, we're gonna. Is is it out completely? It's flashing. Yeah. Um. It seems like pretty soon we're gonna be in the uh, the members only section of the yes. uh, <laughs> of the lecture. So. Um. I'm gonna have to order a new battery. Should I stop it? No, no, no. I'll let it run out. Okay. Let it run out. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Just let it run out. Yeah, but I'm going to have to, poor little camera, probably going to have to get a better memory card too. It's not the camera's fault, really. Yeah, it's my fault. Again, input, output. Anyway. <clears throat> so, like, are you guys, like, actually, like, getting this? Like, you guys, are, is this making sense to you guys? Because, uh, like, this is, like, like, Understanding this example at this stage is of fundamental importance to like everything else we're going to cover in this class. Um, the stuff we're learning here is so fundamental it will never be directly tested. It's just going to be a part of every single every single problem that you that you write. All right, make sense. So if you have any conceptual problems with any of this material. Best to sort them out now. Alright? Good. So, I'm going to skip that. Um, skip that. Okay. So, here's another program. The purpose of this program 